Um, want to introduce Christopher Snell from Renovate. He's going to talk to us about migrating from public cloud to private cloud or some amount of hybrid. I don't know. I only have a little synopsis, and it's actually pretty much that line right there. So you know what I know. Uh, so, Christopher. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris. Uh, I'm from uh, Revenate, and Revenate is a SaaS company. We're based in San Francisco. I work down in Tacoma from home, and uh, I worked there for a little over a year. And before that, I was at Rackspace for about six years. And before that, a company in Park City, Utah called Backcountry.com. Um, so, uh, Revenate, we're SaaS for the hospitality industry, so that's, that's hotels, that's our, that's our market. We serve most of the large and mid-sized hotel chains with our software. And our software, we, we have two big products right now. One is an online relationship manager. So this is a piece of software that hotels can use to, uh, stand behind the mic here, uh, hotels can use our, our ORM software to to get a quick uh, synopsis on how they're doing on ratings, ho hotel rating sites and social media uh, to understand if people are saying good things about the hotels or bad things and complaints. And so they can, you can see what that screen looks like on the, on the bottom left there. Um, so they can see you know, the, the reviews and problems with their hotels and address those quickly. Our new product is called Inguest. You can see it uh, on the right, uh, introduction to it anyway. Uh, this is rich guest data for hotels. Hotels want to understand their customers so they can cater to them better and, and deliver more of the things that they're looking for. So Inguest mines uh, uh, their customer's stay history along with uh, social media so we can deliver to the hotels information about that customer so that they can make the customer happy. And it's also uh, an, an app that allows uh, customers to do things like order make spa appointments or order room service from their, their mobile device, uh, as well as leave reviews for the hotel and get uh, issues addressed. So that's Revenate. <clears throat> uh, so the, the story of our migration to, to private cloud, when I got, I got to Revenate in Q4 of uh, 2013, and by uh, Q1, we had about 200 instances in Rackspace Public Cloud, and that was growing every day. <clears throat> we were growing you know, probably a good 20 to 30 instances every month we were piling on to that in Rackspace Public Cloud. So probably compared to what a lot of you guys working for the larger companies, it's a pretty small cloud, but for us it felt pretty big. And for uh, when, I, when I started, I was just a shop of one guy. So it was a lot of stuff <coughs> to be responsible for, is, you know, all the chef, um, you know, the DevOps work as long as, along with uh, system administration, uh, and then the business side of negotiating, like, uh, the hosting deals with Rackspace and such, I handled all that. Uh, we, we had about 600 or 800 gigs of instance RAM uh, in that, uh, across those 200 instances. A bunch of cloud databases. Uh, we made heavy use of that product. It's just a MySQL uh, soft database as a service product. We also used their, uh, oops, uh, we used their, uh, their load balancer product as well. Had about a dozen of them. And we were, like I said, growing 20% month over month. Every, every month we were getting 20% bigger. Um, <clears throat> we, were, we were having some... I'm sorry, can you clarify what that means by uh, what a load balancer is in the cloud? Is that a single IP? Uh, yes, that's a single IP for a single service. We use them for front end and back end. So if you went to www.revenate.com, you go through that. Likewise, if you queried an elastic search, uh, you ran an elastic search query, it hit that. So we used them for a lot of different places. Um, the thing about public cloud for us, it was really, really expensive. Uh, Five-figure hosting bill I, every single month. I don't want to say exactly what it was because that's kind of uh, competitive information for us, but it was in the mid five figures every month uh, for those 200 instances and all that other crap. Um, really, really expensive. Uh, it was also really, really crappy. Uh, Rackspace public cloud. I don't know how this co compares to AWS because I've honestly, other than like a small projects. I've never put anything big in AWS, but with Rackspace Public Cloud, we had really bad network performance. Um, sometimes it was great. Sometimes it was just crap. Sometimes stuff would just uh, partition for no reason at all. And if, I don't know if anyone here run Elasticsearch, anyone familiar with it? Okay, so there's a couple of y'all. So you probably know about the network partitions and split brain scenarios with Elasticsearch. It was really, really tough to run in the public cloud. Um, <clears throat> 
because we are a data company, we are a data-driven company, so we have a lot of data storage. That's the majority of our back end. Um, also with the public cloud, a lot of noisy neighbor problems, and Rackspace couldn't do much about that. You would get people that would use and abuse these cloud servers, and you had the bad um, fortune of being co-located on that, that server with them. It was not gonna be fun. <clears throat> There's also, this being the public cloud, <clears throat> constant scanning on both their private and public networks for vulnerabilities. Uh, we block that with IP tables, but maintaining IP tables rule sets for an ever-changing public cloud is, is, is difficult, right? So we had, a, we had a lot of scanning. It's just constantly, every second, excuse me, there's something going on with that at Rackspace. <clears throat> Sorry. Just a quick one. You came from Rackspace, did you, before you moved in? Was that, did they have the public cloud then, or was it the... It, we did. You did? Okay, cool. So you had the inside knowledge and the outside? I did. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I was the, I was the uh, one of the first operations leaders um, that started with Rackspace. Was, uh, at the time, it was called Moso, okay, the cool. early cloud product. So I stayed, I was there for six years, and from the genesis of their uh, public cloud to what it was a year ago, okay. a year and a half ago when I left, yeah. Question? Is that why you chose Rackspace over AWS when you changed jobs? We were actually already in Rackspace Public Cloud when I came on board, so that was a, a nice thing for Revenate, is to have someone that was familiar with that. Although, when it came time to make a decision to move out of Rackspace Public Cloud, I did evaluate AWS, as well as some uh, dedicated environment at SoftLayer, and also looking at co-location at, for instance, like BioWest, which is what I did at uh, Backcountry. I had a big colo environment there. So I looked at a bunch of different things and uh, you know crunched the numbers, and I'll talk about what led us to the private cloud. But uh, <clears throat> there's three three big reasons why we went to a private cloud, in the end, uh, cost, performance, and security. <clears throat> so we can talk about uh, private cloud cost. Uh, with the in public cloud, we you know I said we had about 800 gig of instances, uh, shared networks shared software load balancers and others shared with other unknown Rackspace customers and IP tables, firewalls. <clears throat> we were paying, like I said, in the mid five figures. With private cloud, <clears throat> we have two and three quarters uh, terabyte of RAM across all of our physical servers, uh, 22 dedicated physical servers plus two controller nodes, so 24 in total. Uh, dedicated private networks on dedicated Cisco switches that, that are HA and dedicated just to us. So all our own bare metal stuff. <clears throat> and dedicated hardware load balancers, F5, 1600 LTMs, and dedicated uh, Cisco ASA firewalls. Um, for that, we're paying about 90% of what we were paying for, I guess, uh, less than a third of uh, the hardware and functionality. What were you doing for storage, both in the public and the private side? Local, local storage for everything. Quick one. Um, does that cover so? And I, I don't know what you mean actually by private cloud, but in the public cloud, a lot of the management is taken away, so a lot of that headcount cost is gone. When you went to the private cloud, was that also not outsourced in a similar way? It was just you on your own dedicated, or have you allowed for that in your 90%? I'll talk a little bit about that, but for, for public cloud and private cloud, we're basically at the same service level where the infrastructure is provided for us. And we are responsible for the OS and above. Okay, gotcha. All right, perfect. So same thing. It was uh, unmanaged OS is what we've what we've been using. Okay. <coughs> so for the F5s, you didn't need like a network guy to do F5s. Exactly, we didn't. They take care of all that for us. And I'll talk. That's that's a that's a good point. I don't really have slides that talk about that, but that's a huge thing for us. You know, being a shop of one. Yeah. Like I I know iOS a little bit, and I can I can I can get around a Cisco firewall and, and F5 configuration syntax, but. That's a lot to manage all that. It was quite a broad, that's why I was wondering, it was quite a broad range of skills, but I think I've got you now. Exactly, <laughs> all, these, you know, all these skills, I'd say easily Rackspace saves us uh, one to two full-time headcount, one network administrator, and probably one open stack administrator. Performance, <clears throat> big reason we went to private cloud, probably the biggest reason. The network is incredible compared to public cloud, at least I should preface this, uh, Rackspace has some new public clouds that have some pretty decent network performance. Still variable, still subject to noisy neighbor problems on the network. They won't tell you that, but it, it's definitely definitely there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the performance in Rackspace private cloud is absolutely insane. It's awesome. You, get, you can get a gigabit uh, each direction <clears throat> from any of your instances in your private cloud, no matter how big or small they are. 
So one thing we were often finding ourselves doing is creating things like load balancers, um, uh, you know, VIPs in general on, on a big public cloud instance. We didn't need 32 gigs of RAM. We actually need like a gig of RAM or two gigs of RAM. But <clears throat> they, the, more, the bigger instance you got, the more bandwidth you got, and we needed the bandwidth. So we were basically buying a bunch of crap we didn't need. Um, just to get the bandwidth on this, I can spin up a 512 meg instance and get the same bandwidth, and it's, it's truly phenomenal. <clears throat> so that's just a quick capture of, a, of a, you know, an instance, some, a snapshot the other day of just you know, kind of what you can expect out of these. I've, I've even sent more than that. That's about close to 900 megabit right there. You can get pretty close to gigabit <clears throat> speed. Uh-oh. Connection loss. Oh man, let's go. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Performance, you're your own noisy neighbor, so <clears throat> you can steal all the CPU and disk you need from your other instances. That is something you do have to watch in the private cloud. Is uh, if you know we have some spidering instances that do some scraping, web scraping. Those are really hard on the systems, and it kind of sucks sometimes to be <clears throat> to be on the same system as those. But overall, our CPU usage is very low. Running out of water. You may have to get some more water here in a sec. <clears throat> our CPU usage is low, and our disk uh, our disk I/O <clears throat> is very very low as well. It's we're we're very light on the systems. What we're not light on is RAM. Our particular workload uses tons of RAM, and so that's uh, that's mostly what you'll see. Um, <clears throat> security, uh, you know, quite awesome in private cloud with those dedicated uh, firewalls out in front of you. Rackspace controls the firewall uh, tables, the, the ACLs on those. We can make requests. You know, it's, it's just as simple as a picking up the phone or opening a ticket to punch a hole in a firewall. They actually have a web interface that you can do it as well. It's, we, don't, we don't find ourselves doing that very often, so it's not a big hindrance to us. But thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, but you know, with the private cloud, we don't see any more uh, scans, automated things hitting us. And um, the, the IP tables rule sets is another big thing I'll talk about. So there's also, you said you use these internal scans. Is that because your IP space is just fundamentally different than what they're offering to the public and so they're not known? It's, it, it, it's a true private behind a firewall network. So it's not accessible from anything outside. But, but aren't they doing like packet encapsulation with the XLANs or something like this? No, it's, it's all on physical switches in the same cabinet. So you're not actually, it's not like a soft layer type deal where it's like a VLAN or something like that. It's, it's, that little, all of it. yeah, it's, it's Once four it gets to you, it's, it's, yeah, it's, our, our gear is four cabinets with four sets of HA top of rack switches and it's all truly private on the, on the private side. There's nobody else on that LAN. <clears throat> on, not only the leak, you know, the, the IP layer, but down to the physical hardware, it's, it's all our own. The IP tables rule sets were a total pain in Chef, as I'm sure all you guys know that run Chef or Puppet or anything like that. Try to keep track of every server that's allowed to talk to your Elasticsearch load balancer is, is a total pain in the ass. And it's, vul it's easily screwed up, easily, you know, stuff either doesn't work or you're letting too many people in. Um, we don't have to worry about that anymore. DOM zero threat is reduced. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever like, I'm sure it's happened. Someone's busted through it. it one of these public cloud providers, but it's a little peace of mind that no one else sits on our hypervisors anymore. And everybody gets IPsec VPN, all the devs, so no more going through our janky uh, open VPN running on a public cloud instance that sometimes works with the network that sometimes goes down. <clears throat> Everyone gets a IPsec VPN uh, to a pair of HA firewalls, so like VPN is just rock solid and no one ever complains about it. Whereas it was a huge problem before, like trying to manage open VPN for everyone. <clears throat> Any questions so far about yeah. that? So you're not doing like a network-based VPN, it's a client-based VPN in the environment, is it? Or we, we have two kinds. We have oh. client to site, you know, yeah. so people like uh, Mac laptops yeah. and gotcha. And then site to site, like my home has a site to site. Gotcha. Because like, it's you're secure. <laughs> I can run a good network, so. <clears throat> yeah. Um, instance sizing, this is another cool thing about running your own cloud. You can be as creative as you want <clears throat> coming up with instance sizes. Like, 
you know, we had we found some sweet spots for Elasticsearch, and we knew what we needed, and we could custom create these instance sizes that matched exactly what was needed, so we weren't wasting disk space, and we weren't <clears throat> finding ourselves buying more than we needed, <clears throat> like we were doing in that in the uh, public cloud. We've kind of settled on this list. This is a partial list, but it's it's something about like or like 20 of them or so that we've created so far, um, various sizes. It's kind of hard to see on the screen, but. API driven, so it uses the Nova APIs to manage the, the instances, which is if you're familiar with OpenStack, it's OpenStack, you know, and the same thing as Rackspace Public Cloud. Excuse me. And all the tools that you use to work with Rackspace Public Cloud will work with this. Uh, and as will they also work if you have an internal OpenStack uh, cluster in house. So it's it's tools you're all familiar with. <coughs> How the managed private cloud works for us. Um, we have responsibility for the instance layer and above. Everything below the instance um, is Rackspace's responsibility. So they manage the open stack, they manage the server hardware, including one hour replacement on any hardware, like the disk goes bad, um, all the network gear, the data center, all that stuff they do. We have visibility into open stack and the server hardware network, and I'll talk a little bit about more of that, but we do our own network monitoring for that. The migration. <clears throat> so migrating to uh, migrating to this private cloud was about a nine month adventure. It was crazy. Um, it was not uh, you know like I'd done a data center move at Backcountry and we moved everything to a new data center in one night. This was a nine month piece by piece migration. <clears throat> um, we we couldn't do everything at once, so we had to do component by component. We started with our uh, our data storage layer. Um, uh, Basically, databases is what we started with, and then we moved up the stack from there, and load balancers and such were the last things to, to migrate over. Um, the only, the, this is probably the biggest reason we chose uh, Rackspace as opposed to a co-location, besides the support and the fact that we'd have to hire like an OpenStack engineer, um, this Rack Connect thing. We needed a way to migrate out of public cloud, but um, as those of you that run Elasticsearch, no, ES does not replicate well over the WAN. At least it didn't in the .9 versions that we were running when we were doing this migration. Um, it's, it, it can get into all sorts of hairy split brain situations. And um, so Rackspace has this thing called Rack Connect that allows you to tie public cloud to private cloud and make them, make them work together. And that was the only way we were able to get Elasticsearch migrated out of out of public cloud and into private cloud. It basically puts them almost like they're link local together. It's 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 routed, but uh, oh, that was a quick one. And were they local or it was it was so it was, it was. still within same the data same center. data center. Okay, cool. that was kind of a, a crappy, ugly constraint about this. We were in the our public cloud was in Rackspace DFW data center, and that data center is basically full, and so we had to fight tooth and nail and wait for customers to churn and go away to snag racks for our gear in that data center. It was kind of a pain in the ass. So that is one downside. If you're in a public cloud in a data center that is full, you may not be able to move to private cloud because there may not be, unless you're gonna replicate over a WAN, and that wasn't an option for us. Um, so uh, the first thing we needed to do when we moved to private cloud is build a base OS image. You know, being in private cloud, we're no longer using their crappy you know, selection of like whatever Ubuntu, you know, that's like six months behind on updates and all that crap, you know, whatever you're dealing with, their images that they get that are, some of them are decent, some of them are not. So we built our own, uploaded it into, uh, into, into uh, the uh, slip in my mind, the OpenStax uh, image, ma image uh, service. Glance. glance, thank you. Glance, oh, send them into Glance. Um, we use Ubuntu 14.04 for most of our stuff. Um, we, had, we had to do some customization at Etsy RC Local uh, to do some one-time kind of first boot provisioning when the instance first boots up. Sets up a couple different things you can read about down there. Um, it also alerts us um, via hip chat if the instance doesn't boot right. Uh, I'm gonna show you just kind of a, a snapshot of this. Some of the parts have been redacted, but this is my Etsy RC Local. So I create a file called Etsy first boot that's on that image, so when the image boots up, if that file exists, it runs all this crap, then deletes that file, so it'll never run again. It's just a run once, rc.local. Uh, once we had 
that the next thing I need to do is build out some basic infrastructure, uh, built our own DNS system using uh, DJB DNS and DNS cache. Um, logging, I have some RSYS log logging instances that uh, everything forwards through as a central logging server, and that goes off the paper trail. Chef, anyone from Chef Ops Code here? Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna tell you all. <laughs> all right, I don't want to offend anyone from there, but I, I'm gonna. I just gotta tell it like it is. We we were an enterprise chef user. We were paying them like whatever the 400 bucks a month for their 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 service, and that thing was such a pile of crap. You know, it was like you would like upload a cookbook and it would fail like a third of the time, and it was slow and it was pr problematic, and we were having authentication problems, and then we we're like, let's. While we were testing out, you know, building out this public cloud, we built our own Chef server using open source, and oh my God, it freaking worked every time, and <laughs> it like it was like lightning fast, and nothing broke, and it was free. And so I was like, screw those guys. We canceled our 400 a month service and to go with their open source package. I don't know were what's you using hosted. What's that? You were using hosted. Or? We were using hosted, yeah, at, at their on on their premises, and we moved to our own, and it totally rocks, and we've had zero problems with it. <laughs> There's someone in ops code right now. Oh, I'll see about that. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so we set up our own internal chef server for this, um, <clears throat> along with SMTP. We're, we send tons of email, so we had to uh, set up some forwarders for that. Moving with Chef. Um, chef was instrumental in moving 400 instances. We set up our. Uh, uh, we started with a fresh repo. When I got to this company, there was like three different kinds of. Uh, configuration management going on there. The first guy that uh, was there was basically, when they first started, they didn't do any configuration management. It was hand-built servers. And then they had the, the uh, when they hired their first admin, um, it was, this guy was a puppet guy, but he wasn't really good. And he, <laughs> He, he couldn't come up with like consistent naming for servers and like his cookbooks or his puppet recipes were just kind of all over the place. And it was kind of a mess. Um, you know, but it sort of worked, but I didn't really understand it. Then we, you know, right before I had started, they'd been working with Chef. And so um, my boss, Wayne, who uh, had built our Chef infrastructure, did a pretty good job. But the problem was, is only like a portion of the stuff was on the Chef. So we had like a mismatch of everything. And so what we did is we started with a fresh Chef repo for everything. So everything we had to build, rebuild. As we moved components over, we built fresh cookbooks from them. Sometimes we pulled from our old stuff if it was good. But most of the time, we were just writing new cookbooks from scratch. Um, like I said, open source Chef server. Um, we use Gangnam Style Chef cookbooks. If anyone here is on that, it's totally awesome. It's like basically cookbooks over cookbooks. I won't do the dance, but, but uh, you know, like... <laughs> It's, it's basically, instead of using roles, we use cookbooks because we can version those. And we have a base role that installs common stuff, like sets up our syslog logging and sets up monitoring, uh, the monitoring agent, things like that, DNS uh, and whatnot. <clears throat> what are you doing for monitoring? I'll talk about that in a minute. We use that Datadog. We went through several iterations on that. It was kind of a mess at first. Um, <clears throat> how we moved, we started with the data layer. I think I, I said this earlier. It's the hardest to move, lots of lots of data for us. And <clears throat> we use replication to move it for pretty much all of our databases. Um, for everything, we used uh, replication. Uh, we did one cluster at a time. And the way we did that is we would spin up a, <clears throat> typically a slave node, like for MySQL, spin up a slave in the private cloud, set it up, get replication going to that, then promote it to master, point everything at it, and break and kill off the old servers. So that worked pretty well. Elasticsearch was a lot harder. <laughs> it was like, anyone ever played the egg toss game where you like see how far you can throw an egg to your buddy? Yeah, that's, that was like doing that Elasticsearch <laughs> migration. Elasticsearch is super sensitive to everything. And um, <clears throat> so migrating it wasn't easy. <clears throat> the way we would do it is we would migrate one node at a time. And every time uh, you change something in ES, it, the cluster state goes from green to yellow to red sometimes depending, and you have to wait for it to return a green and reshuffle all of its, its shards um, across the servers each time. So it took a long time. It would take, we could do, a, a big cluster would take us about four or five hours a night to do. And so we, we would uh, move 
clusters over, we, we uh, one thing we did is we designated some master only nodes, which is real important for making Elasticsearch happy in a big cluster. Uh, we set up master only nodes, and we use this uh, cluster routing allocation exclude IP um, to exclude the public cloud servers that we were getting rid of from getting data. Because when you would pull a machine to move it to private cloud, it would reshuffle that data across the service, across the cluster, and we didn't want that data being shuffled back on the public cloud that we were trying to kill off. So we excluded the public cloud nodes from getting data. All the data shifted to the private cloud. Maybe I missed this before. You, you talked about a nine-month nine migration. Mm -hmm. What was the bulk of the time then in that nine months? A lot of it was writing cookbooks, okay. um, moving Elasticsearch. Um, <clears throat> a lot of it was waiting on developers. Uh, we're, we are not a op shop driven DevOps. Um, DevOps is something that's embraced across our company. Um, every engineer works with this stuff, and they, our, our, our software developers are writing their own chef cookbooks, um, some more than others. But, but uh, we uh, had to wait for everyone to kind of get with the system on our new cookbook style. And, and create cookbooks to provision their gear. Sometimes there was complicated transitions to move stuff over. Because we work with a lot of external entities like hotels, we would have services that some hotel out somewhere has to uh, connect to, and you have to deal, if it's a big chain with their security department, to have their IP, their, their firewall tables changed. So there's a lot of, lot of coordination with each piece that got moved over. So it, yeah, it, it took about nine months. Um, data stuff went first. That was fairly easy. It wasn't easy, but it was stuff that we could do without having to tell anyone because we used the, the Rack Connect to link our front end servers, the PHP based web app, to the back end stuff that was already in public in private cloud. <clears throat> Monitoring and metrics. Um, so this is, this is kind of the last part of my uh, presentation. This is the most devops -y part, I guess. Um, uh, we're on Havana. We're on Havana right now. That's, that's a couple of versions behind, I guess, now in terms in the OpenStack world. It was the latest that Rackspace um, had available at that time. It was like their brand new release was Havana. And here we are like a year later, and they're telling us they're end of, end of lifing it, and they're going to cut our support in a few months for it. I'm not real happy about that. <laughs> We're gonna have to figure something out there, but yeah, Havana is a total pile um, when it comes to really um, having something that's easy to upgrade and um, easy to work with um, from an administration, from their perspective. But, um, I love how you, I mean, you get some massive performance out of your virtual CPUs if you're using 1,200 out of 500. Yeah, well, I mean, that that is, uh, you can't oversubscribe CPU pretty pretty heavily, and. And you know, given that we're yeah we're basically almost triple three x oversubscribed, and we're still at like twenty percent CPU usage on most nodes. Yeah, De definitely. I you know it's 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 definitely oversubscribed. But uh, a lot of the stuff with the the memory, uh, their their metrics here is a total joke. Like we're using two terabytes of two terabytes, which is a little over three quarters. Like I don't even know what that means. Like I don't think they do either. And there, there's a lot of stuff like that. We, we had no idea, you know, as we were adding, we bought this cluster of 16, 16 or initial cluster had 16 compute nodes. It was based on kind of what I thought we were at in the, in the public cloud. I had no idea how close we were to filling that up. And I kept asking them and they couldn't tell me. And well, they, they would tell me, I, I could ask them and they would generate a support ticket. Once a week, they would come back with a report about how much RAM we used and like, Dude, I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. How am I supposed to know when I'm getting close to filling this thing? They couldn't tell me. So I needed a solution. Um, some of the problems we were having, you know, inaccurate metrics, you saw that. I had no historical trends or graphs, so I couldn't see what we were doing. I had no idea what we were using on the network cards, that, you know, in terms of throughput, peak throughput. Um, no cluster-wide metrics as a whole. Um, I couldn't do any capacity planning with the metrics they were giving us for OpenStack. It was terrible. Um, and no alerting, so I had no way of knowing, you know, if we were saturating a, a network interface, um, you know, other than like their alerting, which which sometimes works. Um, and the solometer is is the stats. It's at at the time of Havana, it was a brand new project for OpenStack stats. It was really broken back then. I'm sure it's probably fine now, 
but back then, if you made an API query against Solometer, it would literally like lock the service up, and I'd have to open a ticket and get some dude to restart it, so I could run another query. It, you know, it just it wasn't even working. Uh, <clears throat> I went round and round with them, and they're like, "We're working on it." And I spoke with like product people, and I'm I'm a, like I said, a six year racker. You know, I'd spent some time there, so I know some people to talk to. And I could never get a good answer on monitoring. And I finally just was, like a year later, I was just absolutely fed up. And I, and I got sick of waiting. So we built our own based on Datadog. <clears throat> we tried a bunch of different uh, monitoring services. Copper Egg was one. I don't know if anyone here has ever used them. They're total crap. Uh, looked at, <laughs> yeah, that was garbage. And then uh, server density we looked at. We looked at, uh, you know, Nagios, which is what we used in public cloud, which is decent, but sometimes a bear to maintain. But we settle on Datadog. Datadog is, is a pretty awesome service. Um, it's metrics and alerting, right? So it's an agent that you install on all of your instances. In our case, we only installed on production instances because one of the cons of Datadog is, is it's very expensive. Um, you know, the per instance cost is something like three or four X what all the other competitors charge. Uh, but it's truly awesome and it works so well. It's got all these out-of-box integrations. Uh, so. You know, I can give it a, a read-only user on my MySQL server, and it can start getting stats. I can give it access to the memcache stats port, and it starts. It builds up dashboards based on all of that. Um, you can write custom checks in Python, and uh, we did that. So I've written about ten so far, and we're pulling all sorts of custom data with that. And the coolest thing is, it's got this really, really awesome graph builder that uses JSON uh, to describe graphs. So you can overlay different types of metrics together and different system events like chef runs and whatnot and code deploys, as well as do math and statistics processing on that data, which is pretty neat. Any questions so far? I know I'm kind of plowing through these. But <clears throat> so I'm going to do a demo. Just show you some of the stats that, <clears throat> that we got going in Datadog here. <clears throat> So while you're doing that, do these agents send all the data back out over the internet then to a SaaS service? Is that how it works? Or? They do. It, it, it is a, it's a SaaS service, and they're hosted, I believe, in, in AWS. Okay. <clears throat> and so let me... Uh, yeah, so their, their little agent... Um, let see if I can... Yeah, that's as good as I'm going to get. Um, yeah, so it's a it's an agent that runs on all the servers. It's it's written in Python and and it sends events and it sends metric data. Events are things like chef ran or a code deployed or someone logged an issue with a server, um, and then it sends metrics. The the thing we use most of these dashboards. I have a bunch of them. Pretty much for all of our, um, the format here is like app name dash service. So I could go look here and. Look at Elasticsearch for our Inguest product, and <clears throat> you can you can see all sorts of interesting stats here. This is pulled in real time from you know the cluster of like ten or sixteen, um, depending on uh, uh, you know Elasticsearch nodes. Uh -huh. We're gathering all this data and quickly presenting it. You've got the graph right there. It's <clears throat> nine. Yeah. Oh, nine. Is this one nine? This is a nine one. Yeah. Some of them are sixteen, and some of them are nine and ten and fourteen and different different sizes. Yeah, it's nine. Good call. Um, the, um, the big important ones, though, for us, the ones that answered, the, what made Datadog really worth the money for me is the questions it could answer about, um, about OpenStack. And I'm going to show you two. The biggest question I talked about is, like, where are we in terms of utilizing this cluster? Um, once I installed Datadog, I, I gave a, a chef recipe to Rackspace. They build all the hypervisors and controller nodes with chef. So I said, hey, throw this chef recipe, go fetch this cookbook and throw it in your run list. And it installed their agent on all of our hypervisors. So now we have data coming in from the hypervisors. And in like 10 minutes, I built this little dashboard out here. So you can see, <clears throat> we're pretty close to it. This is, I, I, I draw these lines at 80% because this is like my imaginary kind of reorder line. When we start getting close to that red dash line, I want to start ordering new equipment. Some stuff's getting maxed out. <clears throat> We're getting close. We've hit, come close to using up our memory on these on these clusters. Uh, <clears throat> CPU, not even close. You know, we're at like 18% or something. Uh, disk space, almost nothing. Um, network throughput, um, most. This is uh, 
this average throughput you're seeing here is that's um, the average throughput of a hypervisor. If you average the throughput through all of our hypervisors, that's what you get. It's, it's actually pretty low. Um, some of them are skewing that average pretty heavily, but uh, you can see our busiest, I made this list of our top five busiest hypervisors in use. You know, some of them are a little hotter than others, 35%. You know, that's a, that's a more busy hypervisor. <clears throat> so that's, that's, this helps me, this dashboard that you just saw is kind of my long-term planning thing. If I'm trying to diagnose some kind of problem with the cluster, I go look at this cluster performance, um, <clears throat> one that we built. This is uh, the maximum CPU in use by any particular hypervisor in the cluster. So every 20 seconds it plots a point of the peak CPU use. So if there's a, if one's running particularly hot, this is uh, useful to look at that. Same thing with uh, peak disk latencies, peak uh, throughputs, um, and also errors. You can see we do have a bit of uh, network interface errors. Um, you know, we, we, run those, we run those pretty hot on some of them. <clears throat> and you can see some, in the bottom right hand corner, some aggregate throughput numbers for how much network traffic we're pushing across all of our hypervisors, which is kind of neat. Um, if you recall, I mentioned that Rackspace gives us access to network devices. They give us read-only SNMP access. So using the Datadog SNMP metric, I have uh, metrics. I'm gonna, I haven't checked this in a couple days, so I hope this is going to work. And Yep, yeah, so we have metrics here, um, some metrics on our F5s. You can see how many connections we have and the, the throughput of the various network interfaces on the F5. Do you have then a, like a local agent running on a server that's then polling all of the other platforms? Yeah, is that and that feeds it back up? Yeah. I, I set up the server I call monitoring, um, and monitoring is running Datadog like all, every other server, but it also runs all of the the SNMP pollers and also all the Elasticsearch and Mongo pollers are being run from this yeah. one host. So that's all the SNMP stuff is being pulled from one Linux box. Um, but that's the, that's the neat thing about Datadog is that you can pull a lot of different metrics and you're only paying for one agent on one machine, but I'm able to pull hundreds of SNMP metrics with that you know, one monthly price of that agent. And so yeah, that's my F5. Here's my ASA. Oh, so, sorry, just to confirm there. So you know you said Picon about it being expensive. It's per agent. So if you are agent, doing right. a whole load of, say, Cisco devices and F5s and stuff, that, that's just one agent. Thing. One agent, yeah, yeah. If you're running it from, a, from a one system, yeah. if you're running all those metrics. But, you know, we run it from our production, so I'm running like 230 agents yeah. currently with them. Um, and I can, so here's, here's some basic ASA stats. You can see we're getting some errors because we're saturating throughput on, on this ASA pretty good. Um, you know, coming out to our public interface, you can see, uh, you know, our spidering operations, you know, are, are sending lots of traffic out of over these little pair of 5520s. Um, finally, um, I'll just show you one last thing here. Um, they have this cool host map. Let me see if I can get this going. So we will group by chef role. So here's all of our different chef roles. Um, and we'll look at uh, we'll look at spider crawlers because those guys are pretty busy. So here's our spider crawlers. Let's let's look at this particular node here. Um, it shows you the different uh, the different uh, roles chef roles that are on there. And I'm going to look at uh, dashboard for this. And this is the system dashboard for this machine. You see those uh, pink vertical bars are chef runs. Those are chef events. Um, but this is, uh, this is, you know, like, this is the kind of metrics you get out. This is the basic system metrics it gathers. And um, finally, got some monitoring. Um, it, it does all sorts of monitoring here. Um, you know, we have basic monitors like the host is not responding. Uh, you know, if the host isn't, uh, hasn't checked in, we get an alert. Um, we also have, like, uh, health checks, uh, you know, like Mongo, MongoDB is not not responding to a health check, those sorts of things. Datadog does that for us, but um, that's all I have, guys. Uh, I, let me let me see. Actually, I have a I have one more. Yeah, that's all I have. Um, so that's the end of my show. But if it, you guys have any questions or want to see something else, I'm happy to show it to you. So if you didn't use Chef, what would you use? Oh man, <laughs> probably salt. Something like that. Yeah. 
So that's that's a great you know great question. We I love and hate Chef. I you know Chef. I've gotten really used to it, so I can rock it out. And Chef, I can throw out a cookbook and you know real quick now um, to do stuff. It has a bunch of funky things. You know, there's just like some to run order things. There's you know there's I'm not gonna lie. There are a few hacks in our cookbooks. You know, Chef rewind here or there. Um, different funky things, uh, you know, credential management through Chef Vault is kind of a pain. It's either, you're either doing it in a really crappy, not so secure way, or it's a total pain in the ass because you're using Chef Vault, you know, so it's, it's, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's, there's a lot of things that kind of just suck about Chef, but, but it does work for us and we're, we're good at it, so. Do you use Chef for your deployments? No. Those are, that's a mix match, it depends on what app. We have a bunch of different apps and several different app teams. Some use, uh, you know, Capistrano, I think, is one of them, and uh, some various different uh, things, I, depending on what team. Some are doing it different ways. So are you, are you privy to how your development team is pushing out their apps to production, like what tools they're using? Yeah, that they're, yeah they're, using, um, they're using, like I said, Capistrano for, for some of those things to, produ to push their, do their code pushes. Um, I'm not totally up on everything that every dev team is using, but they're, they're using a number of different tools. <coughs> it's kind of a dance around your question, but uh, what, did you have a specific question if there was? No, I, no, I'm just interested to see what tools they yeah. have. Yeah, it's, they, they, um, they're using, like I said, we are very, DevOps for us is, you know, it's more of a way of doing things rather than a team. So I run the technical operations team. I'm responsible for, for all these servers and the networks and the and uh, security and, and providing the building blocks of DevOps to the rest of the companies. But the developers practice DevOps. And so they, they are the ones deploying their own code and writing their own chef cookbooks. And up until um, just a couple weeks ago, I was just a team of one. I hired my first guy. He uh, starts in a couple weeks down in Tacoma with me at the, where I live in Tacoma, so we have a little office down there. But, you know, we are we are definitely focused on the infrastructure stuff on my team and providing the building blocks of DevOps that they. So I'll we'll go more into that. Sure. So, so, are your dev guys have access to these data dogs? They have oh, absolutely. They're, they're, modern, they're doing actual operations. They do. Absolutely. Help desk requests. They're doing <coughs> yes. Mod, okay. Yeah, they write their. They create their own dashboards. Um, some of them do. Some of some of the devs are more into it than others, right? Some just sling code all day, and some are really involved in building dashboards and chef recipes. Uh, Datadog's really cool because they have a decent, of all the uh, monitoring providers I tried, their chef cookbook's pretty awesome. All these, uh, these custom uh, probes and stuff are all set up through chef attributes. So you build a chef attribute tree and that translates it to this, their cookbook translates it to this YAML file which is read by their Python agents. Um, so all you have to do is have access to our chef tree and commit access to set up your own monitors uh, through Datadog. And so that's just one, and I have, uh, you know, for instance, we, I talked about logging. I have, um, if, if you have a funky legacy application that can only log to a file, I have chef, a chef recipe that you can run and pass it some attributes, and it will set up our syslog for you to send that into our log pipeline. So um, I provide all these tools that, you know, through common interfaces like Chef, that the devs can use to get their their work done. Do you have any of this open source, or is it all? Um, not I, I've open sourced some of like I've submitted some. I submit a lot of stuff upstream, like to um, Datadog's cookbooks and um, to their agent. I've submitted some checks, like the uh, HTTP JSON check, for instance. Um, our open source stuff on my GitHub.com slash Chris Snell. You'll find a few things. But Revenate, it's not, it's not by any policy that we don't do open source. We just haven't published a lot to there. But we want to start, now that I have a team of two, that's kind of on my list for this year. It's like, <laughs> let's publish some of these cool tools. Um, I, I published a few things on my GitHub repo, like a, uh, some log, uh, some stuff written in Go. I like, I like writing Go. I don't know. If, I know we have some Go fans here. But yeah, Go is my thing. And so I've done a few things in there. But... Definitely going to do some more. Um, like that SCRC local might be useful to someone, so maybe I should put that out there. What are the things you're going to do differently the next time you have to do this? Oh, man. <laughs> this, is, this is already happening because Rackspace has said, 
we we're end of life in Havana, open stack Havana. So anytime you need to build something new, it's going to go on Juno. So I'm going to have to build a side-by-side -side cluster. Um, and we're going to use Juno, which is all uses basically LXC to hold, um, you know, like Docker to host all the core OpenStack services. Um, so it's much more upgradable. But if I was doing this over again, I mean, <clears throat> I would, I don't know, I might reconsider Chef. Um, Rackspace, I've been happy with them. You know, it was interesting going from being an employee to them, with them and loving them to being angry at them all the time in the initial days of getting this thing up. And now I'm back to kind of like, I love them 90% now. <laughs> I like them. They're, they're really good for us. So, um, uh, you know, but doing it differently, um, we're going to have to do it over again. You know, we're going to have to migrate some of this gear. We are to the point, we have grown so much. We're over, we're 400 and something instances now. You know, we are to the point where I don't think we could do it like, it would be extremely disruptive to migrate to Colo now, something like that. It, we maybe have to migrate part of our infrastructure over there, but it would be really <laughs> tough to forklift this thing again. And that was kind of the big rush for our migration, is we realized if we didn't migrate to private cloud soon, we were going to be too big to migrate. So I urge you, if you, if you guys are any ops leadership out here, like, if, you, if you're in charge of making these decisions, think about what you got and, and how fast you're growing and how you would move it if you had to move. Um, you know, because hosting conditions change. Hosting providers get rid of old offerings and, and, and a life them and come up with a new offering that sucks or maybe the new offering's awesome and you need to move to that new offering. But always be thinking about like the next step, what's down the line, what's gonna happen next year and how you might move if, if all of a sudden your provider sucks or goes bankrupt or becomes, you know, there's another awesome choice out there. Yeah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> a couple of quick questions actually. NetFlow, are you sending NetFlow information to Datadog? Does it support NetFlow? It doesn't. I wish we could get NetFlow out of our, I would love NetFlow out yeah, of our ASAs. Good. For those that haven't used NetFlow, it's uh, basically every time a connection is open and traffic's moving through a, a NetFlow capable firewall, it sends out this over this proprietary protocol that says like, hey, this connection is open from this IP to this IP on these ports it's, and sent this amount of data. It's kind of like a, having a Wireshark, yeah. a Wireshark tap on your firewall, which is really cool for doing metrics. Maybe it's now, too heavy for them or something. If they're they, 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 yeah. they, that's just kind of the limitation of dealing with Rackspace's yeah. managed gear is if it's out of their spheres of support, they oh, just okay. don't want to do it. Oh, but does Datadog support it then? So no, they oh, don't okay. have a NetFlow collector, yeah. but you can write one. You know, oh, you, okay. yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. could. You could. And the you said about the you're going to need to start upgrading it. So because you're running out of memory, yeah. say, um, given that you're so low on the CPU, is your current plan? Because I'm guessing rack space is a problem anyway. Would you, do you reckon you'll just rip and replace server units with just higher density memory ones? Or we've thought about it. Yeah. Um, you know, the way that they're pricing. I don't want to get too much into oh, the yeah, pricing, yeah, yeah. but the way their pricing works, it's better deal for us just to add more nodes. Gotcha. You know, to, we do 128 gig and two dual hex procs. Yeah. So 12 cores, 128 gig of RAM, and eight, uh, two terabyte, or no, I'm sorry, eight 600 gig SAS drives gotcha. um, in RAID 10 is, is what we have in these systems. So about expand. two terabytes of storage, yeah. And we just add more nodes. Um, we're gonna have to stand up this new yeah. Juno cluster because they've said that we're gonna get to this point where they will not allow us to add any more nodes onto that cluster and we're gonna to have to stand up a new cluster. So that's gonna be painful because the new Juno requires like three controller nodes and you know it's just a bunch of overhead and crap that we don't really want. But okay. yeah. Any more questions? Well thanks guys. Really appreciate y'all having having me up and thanks um I'll put this on slide share um, and I think you guys are gonna do something with it as well. Uh, White Pages, thank you guys very much for uh, having me.